my boy Dougie got another story here. One of which that it seems like a bunch of you guys have already enjoyed. I have yet to hear this story. The story of the feral people of the Appalachian Mountains. It's a long one, but an hour and 12 minutes. But we're going to watch and check it out right here together. For those of you who haven't seen or heard this story, I'm excited. This man is a phenomenal storyteller. Let's listen. He just says, you have a couple of hours in there with you. We would like to have them back, please. And the man looks at us with a horrified look on his face and starts barking at us. Y'all didn't tell me you wanted them. And the girl starts pleading to him immediately, asking him to not let them in. And me and Sam try to butt in that we don't want anything to do with these people. They've been chasing us. And he basically just yells, shut up at all of us. And takes a big, deep breath before saying, there's nothing I could do to help y'all. They've already claimed you. I'm so sorry. Oh, Lord, have mercy. So I have to preface this story with an incident that happened to somebody else before I could get into what happened to me. When I was a kid, about 10 or 11 years old, I got the chance to go on this crazy camping trip with a bunch of other kids. It was located at Shenandoah National Park. My parents actually won a raffle at a block party and the prize was two tickets to this awesome wilderness adventure, camping trip for kids. If you're not familiar with Shenandoah National Park, it's in Virginia, north of Charlottesville. It's right along the Appalachian Mountains Trail. I went with one of my best friends named Adam and our parents stayed at a lodge close by for a little vacation for themselves as well. This trip was absolutely absolutely one of my favorite childhood memories before it went south. This trip had everything. A beautiful campsite, awesome rivers, open meadows for sports, great camp counselors that were super responsible but still fun. I'd never done anything like this so I would get so excited every morning to run out of my tent and see the itinerary for the day. And the last morning of the trip I ran out to see the plan and I saw on the itinerary board hike the Hawksbill Summit. I was so pumped. We were actually going to go summit a legitimate mountain today. This felt like a quest to me and I was was ready. When everybody else woke up, we all funneled into a bus to get closer to the summit. Because let's be real, we were just kids and we couldn't handle such a long hike. This is very important. There was also two trail options. One was shorter and steeper, and the other one was longer but less steep. The camp counselors chose the slightly longer but less steep route for the kids. Because we had plenty of water and food to be out there longer, and less steep means less chance of injury. They just wanted to do a fun, safe hike for us to end this amazing week. Unfortunately, if we took the other route, Tyler would probably still be alive. I say this because the more steep route had way less opportunities to mess around off trail. There were steep drop-offs and much less access to safe valleys or any other open areas that were off trail. The trail that we took had way more space on either side of the trail and it was much less intimidating to wander off. And there was so much space to wander off in the first hour of the hike. Everybody stayed on trail during the ascent because we were all so excited to summit the mountain. But you know how kids are. On the way back, we need something else to entertain us. So now Naturally, we start looking for that next thing. And that next thing happened to be flowers. We were about an hour away from the bus, but we were pretty close to flatter ground because we were close to the bottom of the mountain at this point. And there was about 30 yards of space to the right of the trail, right before the tree line into the forest. And across the tree line, there was about five feet of big patches of beautiful flowers. The flowers were a mixture of light blue and yellow. Apparently the group ahead of us was begging their camp guide to see if they could go pick a couple flowers. The group ahead of us was about 10 girls and then one boy named Tyler. Their camp guide said yes and they all started running slightly off trail. When kids see other kids do something that they're not actually supposed to do, it triggers the kids that aren't doing that to beg their camp guide to also be allowed to do that thing. And our counselor obliged and he said, we have one minute to run and grab some flowers and then run back back to the trail. Our group was about 10 boys. And by the time we got to where the girls were, all the girls were already finishing up and running back. When I got up there, I noticed that there was two adults also picking flowers inside of the tree one. They were wearing all white baggy shirts and shorts and they had flower embroiders around the collars and the sleeves. To be honest, they seem really friendly. They both had all white hair and they seemed like sweet grandma and grandpa types. At least that's how my child brain rationalized it. I could see a bit through the trees behind them and I could tell that there was a clearing after about a hundred yards of foliage. There was plenty of movement in that clearing. There had to be at least 30 people over there and they seemed to all be wearing the same clothes as these two older people right next to me. It didn't strike me as odd at the time because I was just too young. But looking back at it now, we were in the wilderness and they were not dressed right. Also, who would just be collecting flowers at this random 
random part of a hike. They didn't seem dangerous at all, though, just friendly and enjoying themselves. And the woman spoke up and said, excuse me, young man, can you please grab that big yellow flower right there by your feet and bring it to me? And little Tyler, the youngest of the group, picked the flower for her. At that same exact moment, the group counselor that's still on the trail yelled, your minutes up. And it immediately turned into a foot race back to the trail for all nine boys. The issue was that Tyler ran to the woman first really quickly as we all immediately ran away only like five feet into the tree line to give her the flower that she had asked him to pick. And apparently he never came out. Apparently this is how it went down. Our counselor let Tyler run up to the girl group before we had went to the flowers to get some water from his sister. And our counselor assumed that the counselor that was in charge of the girls knew that Tyler was with them. But the counselor that was in charge of the girls assumed that Tyler ran back with the boys after we went to go pick flowers. So neither counselor thought about checking for him in their head count. It was the perfect whirlwind of kids running and children mixing for us to lose one of them. I didn't even think about Tyler or the people in the white clothes until we were back at the bus for headcount, a full hour later. I don't know if I thought that he went with the girls or if I was just caught up with me and my friends having fun. But once we had all started racing back, I just didn't think to check if he came back with us. It was a big group, so you don't notice if one person slips away, especially when they're way younger than you and you didn't talk to them much anyway. I'm not sure if I should feel guilty or not, but nobody ever saw Tyler again. When they had done a head count back at the bus and Tyler wasn't there, everybody started absolutely panicking. His sister was crying and calling for him, and the counselors were asking all the kids when was the last time that we remember seeing him. They eventually called in the search and rescue team and every ranger in the area. I remember standing there in line while all of the other adults are freaking out, waiting to tell my answer to one of the search and rescue officers. All the other boys were just saying that they thought he ran back with the girl group. There was a tension in the air that from a child's point of view, we all assumed that somebody might get in trouble for this. So either the other boys didn't know the older people in white that were by the flowers, or they just didn't want to point any blame towards themselves. I didn't think that what I was planning on saying was going to change anything, because I genuinely didn't know if he had come back to the trail with us or not. I just didn't notice. He could have got lost a half hour later for all I know, so I just said, the last time I saw him was by the flowers, talking to two old people in weird white clothes. And I'll never forget the way that the officer reacted. His eyes lit up with terror and he kissed his teeth before asking me, how many people in white did you see? I just told him about the two that I saw up close that seemed friendly and the 30-ish people that I saw in the distance in the clearing behind the foliage. This did not help with the concern on his face. He ended our conversation by saying, thank you for telling me that and can you point towards the counselor that would know where those flowers are? I just pointed at my counselor, but before he went up to question her, another search and rescue officer came up to him for an update and I overheard him relay the information to his partner and the other officer had the exact same look of terror on his face when he heard it but all he replied was since when do they come this close I remember being so confused when he said that he spoke as if he was well aware of the people in white right. like they were common knowledge to the people in the know and that's exactly what I was thinking too from the jump with the moment that he told the the officer or whoever he is the cop he was like yeah, the people in white, and then he had that shot look on his face. I'm like, yeah, they know about the people in white. Talking about since when do they come this close? This close to what? To the kids? To the campgrounds? If y'all know it's this type of people out there, then why y'all allow these folks to bring their kids around? Look, so y'all not going to do nothing? Y'all just going to let them people be out there? What do you mean, since when do they come this close? This close to what? We're in a national park in the Appalachian Mountains. This was as far into the wilderness as I thought people even went. And it seemed that he was implying that this is closer to civilization than these people ever came. As all these thoughts were running through my little 10-year-old brain, the counselor made all of the kids get back onto the bus so we could start heading back to our campsite. Apparently, they searched for Tyler for days and they found absolutely nothing, which made no sense to me. They had to have at least found the people in white and questioned them, but nothing. The white people in white got them. <laughs> oh, man. It's that image of the old white lady in white that got me. And that's why I said that. The word was that he vanished without a trace and there was no suspicious people in weird white clothes in the area. And when I brought up the people that I saw to my parents and the other adults, they brushed it off in a tone that seemed like somebody from the search and rescue team downplayed that part of the story to the adults. This type of response from my parents and the other adults completely contradicted the look on the search and rescue officer's face when I told him. Not to mention the back and forth that I heard between the two officers. But I was just so young and I didn't know how to express myself in a way that could overturn the comforting 
disturbing conclusions that my parents came to about the situation that the officers clearly planted in their heads. For years after, whenever the subject came up, my parents would always say something like, that poor boy that got taken by a cougar, as if the case was closed and there was supporting evidence that he was taken by an animal. But I guess that's just a coping mechanism for parents whose kids were so close to a tragedy happening. They just convinced themselves that all of the questions were answered and they're just grateful that it wasn't their kid. It got to the point where I just eventually stopped arguing about it whenever it came up. As the years passed and the memories faded, I didn't even really think about Tyler or the people in white when I would reminisce about that trip. I would just think about how it changed my life and sparked my love for nature, not to mention adventure in the national parks. I've noticed that 90% of the people that watch these videos are unsubscribed. If you support me and you like these videos, I encourage you to subscribe. I really want to hit a million subscribers by the end of April, so make sure you hit subscribe and the notification bell and enjoy the show. When I was 23, my friend Sam and I planned to go back to Shenandoah National Park. I hadn't been there since I was a kid and Sam had never even been to the Appalachians. We planned to arrive in Roanoke, Virginia and hike a good chunk of the Appalachian Trail, all the way from Roanoke to Shenandoah National Park. It was definitely the longest hike either of us had ever tried, but we weren't too concerned because there was multiple exit points if we weren't sure that we could finish. And I'm sure you guys remember Sam from some of my other stories. Sam is the man and he's my go-to friend for these outdoorsy, woodsy activities. The trail that we were gonna be hiking was about 95 miles long and would take about 35 hours to finish. We planned on staying out there for between five and seven days, depending on how fatigued we got. And when I I tell you we were so excited to disconnect from the world for a week and just enjoy some time in nature especially because our last trip together was more stressful than relaxing and believe me i know what you guys are thinking a five day 95 mile hike is quite a lot but it was something sam and i really wanted to accomplish so we had spent the last few months training for it when i tell you we went full cameron haynes for the past six months i'm talking running lifting sleds pull-ups, hill sprints, you name it, we were ready. We made sure that we were in peak physical condition. So that aspect of this trip wasn't even a slight concern to us. The only worry was this one long stretch that was roughly right in the middle of the trip. It's borderline complete isolation for almost 30 miles. And we just didn't want to run out of food or water during that stretch. So we packed the lightest, most nutrient dense food that we could. Jerkies, power bars, and that freeze dried military grade food. We were approaching this trip more like a mission than a getaway because the only way we would really be able to relax is if we were superbly prepared. I believe that stress only comes from lack of preparation, so we made sure we left no stone unturned. So we were ready to dominate this hike and enjoy every single minute of it. So the time finally comes, the backpacks are packed, we're suited up, we're ready to go. We pull up to the trail entry, we send out the last text to our family, we just let them know that we're about to start and we get to hike it. And the first day went fantastic. There was a lot of people on the trail for the first couple hours. And me and Sam kept up a really good pace. I don't know if it was adrenaline from the first day or because of how great of shape we were in, but we ended up hiking almost five miles more than we were initially expecting to. And when we finally decided to wrap it up for the day, we set up camp a couple meters into the foliage right off the side of the trail. We just had one medium sized tent and a nice little fire, really compact and minimalistic because we didn't really want to spend much time building out our camp every night. And everything went smoothly. We got a nice solid seven hours of sleep before naturally waking up when the sun came up. We packed it up super quick, had an easy calorie dense breakfast with a nice cup of Folgers instant coffee. We got the juices flowing and we headed back to the it's Folgers in your cup trail. The first mile was a little bit tough because we were shaking off yesterday's hike, but once we got a sweat going, we got back to a really good pace. And this is where this story gets weird and takes a bit of a turn. We were coming up to a point in the trail that had a sharp right turn and we couldn't see what was around that corner until we got there. But we were able to hear some chatter as we started to approach the turn. And this was the first time that day where we heard other people. And me and Sam both shoot each other the look to brace for social interaction. Because usually everybody that you pass, you have some type of dialogue with them to make sure that they feel safe while you're passing them. So we put on our happy faces and we turn that corner. And we see two women about 30 feet ahead of us. And it seemed as if they were just hanging out. And I say that because they were just sitting on some rocks right off the side of the trail, just chatting. And their mannerisms were showing me that they were just very content just staying there. They looked like they had settled into this area and weren't planning on hiking anytime soon. And they didn't have any backpacks or hiking gear with them. And as we're getting closer to them, I asked Sam if there's a rest stop nearby. And Sam seems to understand what I'm really asking him because he replies, yeah, isn't it a bit weird that they don't have any gear with them? And I say, I thought it was 10 miles before the next rest stop. And he says, bro, it's more like 12. But these girls don't seem like they're distressed or lost because their demeanor is so cheery. So I immediately assume that they must have a campsite nearby 
where they must be storing the rest of their supplies. And as we get closer to them, their appearance just gets more bizarre because these two girls are wearing matching outfits. They both have on what seems to be homemade white dresses. The dresses go all the way down past their knees, almost how you would imagine an Amish woman would dress if she was dressed up going to a special occasion. These girls do not look like they're in the middle of a long hike. They look well rested and well kept. And as we're approaching them, their body language is showing me that they're excited and happy. And I could tell they're both shooting looks at us, ready to have a fun interaction. They were giving off extroverted vibes. And I could tell that they wanted to chat or have an extended interaction with us. And I was right. As we were walking up to them, both of them just hopped up off of the rocks that they were sitting on. And they kind of skipped up to us, greeting us in really soft, kind voices. While they were simultaneously handing us water and snacks, asking us if we needed anything. They were so friendly and giving. They forced snacks and water bottles into our hands. And they immediately started asking us questions. Like what our trail names were and where we were from. And me and Sam both looked- Wait, hold on. Trail names? That's a thing? What's a- Why? Somebody comment down below. What's a trail name and why? In each other because we don't know what they're doing or why they're even out here. So I just explained to them that we don't have trail names yet. And I just respectfully asked them what their names are and what they're doing out here. More specifically, I asked them if their camp is close by because I'm trying to figure this out. And one of the girls almost flirtatiously put her hand on my shoulder as she was answering me. And she just says, Oh, we're just trail angels, silly. We just make sure handsome boys like you have everything you need. I didn't know what to do in this situation because their friendliness with the undertone of flirtiness felt so out of place out here. I look over at Sam and the girl that's talking to him is literally holding his hand and she's rubbing his chest with her other hand, just asking him if she could get him anything. I was avoiding eye contact with the girl that was talking to me because this felt so forced and awkward. But the girl that was talking to Sam wasn't focusing on me. So I was at trail angel sounds like when you need to get laid in the woods actually able to get a good look at it. and I realized almost immediately that she's under the influence of something the only way I could explain under the influence of crazy under the influence of something the only way I could explain it is that she was on ecstasy or something with the way she was moving around and the way her eyes were wandering so I look back at the girl that's like trying to flirt with me to see if she's also under the influence of something, and I immediately notice her eyes. They weren't bloodshot or anything like that, but her eyes were bizarre. Her irises seemed to be at least 50% bigger than a regular person, and the color was a deep, light amber. She was staring right at me, reaching towards me the same way the other girl was kind of all over Sam, and I immediately got this feeling that I did not want this girl to touch me. There was something off about them, and there was something off about this situation. They were acting too nice, and her eyes were not as welcoming as their mannerisms. They were acting like trail angels, but her eyes had weird predatory intentions. And not only the way that they looked, but the way that she was looking at me. And I take a big step back, and it seemed like Sam was waiting for me to do so, and he did the same. And the girls just stood there right in front of us. But these girls couldn't stay still. They were oddly jittery. One of them was twirling her hair as she was swaying. And the other one was feeling her own clothing with her head on a swivel. As if she was tripping and seeing patterns in the sky. And I try to break the tension of this situation by simply asking them, Are you girls okay? Because it is not normal for two young women to be out here like this. And they definitely shouldn't be approaching random men in this way in an isolated area. And the girl that was talking to me replies, Okay, when life is this beautiful, how can you not be this happy? Now I know for sure these mm. girls are on something because that was the most hippie answer anybody could have ever said. Thanks. Sam does the old thigh slap partnered with the, welp, I think it's time for us to get going. I thought this was genius. Just hit these girls with the classic Midwest dad goodbye. And we don't even hesitate to just walk right around them and keep moving. They don't try to stop us or follow us. They just watch us leave and they're just talking sweet nothings as they're watching us walk off. The second that we're out of earshot and we don't- yeah, What if, what if, <laughs> what if that was their tactic? You know, two girls in the woods and then they come across two guys and they, they might fear the guy. So instead of showing fear, there's like, let's let's do the opposite. Let's mess these guys up and have them tripping <laughs> so that they won't grape us. We're going to go ahead and make them think we crazy. It worked. <laughs> oh, man, that's messed up to assume that somebody would do something to you. It's like when a woman crosses the street 
and y'all y'all walking on the same side of the sidewalk and then she crossed the street so that she can walk on the other sidewalk. I was like, dang, ain't nobody doing that to you. See them behind us anymore? Sam breaks the silence and just says, what were those girls on? And I just reply, bro, all the drugs. Mm -hmm. And we both start laughing hard. And we both agree that once we hit this next rest stop, we should probably let somebody know that there's two girls tripping balls behind mm -hmm. us. But they seemed so well kept and in good spirits that it didn't feel that irresponsible to just leave them there for the time being. And we just keep hiking for about 30 minutes. And without thinking, I just open one of the water bottles that she gave me. And I just take a quick chug out of it. I didn't even think about it when I was doing it. It was just still in my hand from when she gave it to me. So I just took a sip out of that one instead of the one that I had in my backpack. I only took one gulp because it didn't really taste great. Because my water was ice cold spring water stored in a Yeti with electrolytes and all that good stuff in it. So drinking some lukewarm crappy water didn't really do it for me. So I immediately put that water away and I start sipping on my beautiful water. But within 10 minutes, I start getting these weird waves of emotion. I caught myself looking around at the trees and the nature around me in an almost euphoric, highly emotional state. All the colors got a little bit deeper. The sun felt a little bit warmer. My water tasted a little bit better. I didn't think that was possible and my entire mood just felt enhanced. And I actually almost forgot about the weird interaction that we had just had. And I was enjoying myself so much. I could feel my smile on my face. Like my, my muscles on my face were almost getting tired from smiling so hard. And I got another wave of emotion, but this one did not feel right. It felt like something was hitting my system and I could see the patterns on the tree bark moving a little bit. And I knew immediately that those girls just drugged me. If that second wave didn't hit, I might have not noticed it, but I know what a party drug feels like. And the patterns that I'm seeing on these trees and in the leaves are so reminiscent of hallucinogens. So I start to freak out because I have no idea how much got into my system. There could have been a heroic dose in that water bottle for all I know. And I could start kaleidoscoping and losing vision any minute now. And I'm in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains. I'm internally panicking for like five minutes before I finally get some words out. And the only reason I said something is because I saw Sam reach for his water bottle. Woo! Bro, these panic attacks, man. Lord knows if I can live the rest of my life without ever having another panic attack. He's opening the cap and all I could get out is don't. I think they drugged me. Sam is looking at me so confused, but then I see the moment of recognition in his eyes that he can tell that I'm not okay. And I could feel myself fighting off those same jitters that those girls were doing. I just couldn't sit still. Luckily, Sam is super calm and calculated in moments of distress like this. And he just says, dude, we're going to take a rest until you feel like you're ready to keep going. I don't feel necessarily uncoordinated or physically impaired by this, but I'm just not confident that the full extent of these drugs have not kicked in yet. So I just ask him, can we go rest off trail until this thing wears off? Because the thought of other hikers walking past us and seeing me in this state is extremely embarrassing. Bro. Dougie be too good with these stories, man. Ex that's exactly how I would have felt too, bro. I would. I'm already extremely uncomfortable. Probably feel like I'm losing my life right now. About to be out of here into the next life form, which is the spirit form. And at the same time, I'm over here just panicking and got all type of stuff running through my mind. And I'm definitely going to be thinking about the fact that there's probably going to be some other hikers that's going to walk past us and see me over here tripping out. And that's going to make it even worse. Sam just says absolutely and leads the way to a nice little clearing about 20 minutes off the trail. And we just set up that same little camp. I just try to sit and compose myself and stare at the floor while Sam takes our two water bottles and just places them on a log between us. And he's just looking at them, inspecting them. Within 20 minutes of letting those water bottles just sit there, we can see a clear sediment starting to gather at the bottom of the bottle. It just looked like a fine white powder. Luckily, it seemed like mine and Sam's both had a very similar amount of sediment at the bottom. And that gave me a little bit of a relief because I knew that I didn't consume a very large dose. And we just stay there for about two hours until the effects fully wear off. The only side effect that I felt was that I felt a little bit sad, but that's to be expected when you take an upper like that. But why did those girls do that? Why are those girls out here drugging people? Or the better question is, who has those girls out here drugging people? And Sam was clear. I wouldn't have drunk the water bottle in the first place. I would have been like, shit, I already got my Yeti and this full and ice cold. I don't like warm water. Ugh. 
tossed it really mulling over those same questions in his head because right before i probably would have poured it out first because if i have any inkling that this could be potential it, 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 even that gut feeling like i'm not about to take this water from this random person that i do not know pour that mess out even if it doesn't even look like the seal has been broken pour that mess out pour it out before we got up to continue hiking, he just says, listen, we don't stop for anybody from here on out. If we see those girls again, we run because we do not know who's with them. I was a little bit angry and part of me wanted to confront them, but I knew Sam was right and the best thing that we could do was avoid them at all costs. We make our way back to the trail, but everything just feels off now. I just have this sense of dread and paranoia, and I can't seem to shake the downs from whatever they slip me. And I could tell Sam's not enjoying himself either because he's just paranoid at this point. We're just keeping our heads on a swivel for the next hour, but we don't see any signs of anyone until we turn another sharp corner. And those two girls are just standing there, waiting for us as giddy as ever. Almost as if this was the second checkpoint and they were anticipating us. But they weren't that far around the corner this time. They were right there greeting us playfully and trying to have a similar interaction as the one prior. But me and Sam just put our heads down and completely give them the cold shoulder. One of them reaches and tries to grab my arm as we're walking past them. And I take a peek back to look at her face and I could see it in her eyes that she's a little bit confused with a little sprinkle of disappointment in there too. I knew right then she was expecting us to be under the influence of what they gave us. I knew that she can tell that we weren't impaired. So she started saying things like, you both look so thirsty. Why don't you guys take a break and have some water? We just keep it pushing and completely ignore them. Once they were out of earshot and I couldn't hear them giggling anymore, I couldn't help but to continue to look behind us to see if they were following us. But as each hour passed and I kept looking behind us and there was no sign of them i just felt like we lost them we did the same thing that we did yesterday because we were motivated to get as far away from them as possible so we hiked about five more miles than we originally planned and we didn't stop hiking until it was almost completely dark out because we didn't want there to be any visibility of where we decided to get off trail and set up camp we even set up camp twice as far into the woods than we did prior we just wanted to make sure that you could not see our campsite from the trail and when we finally settled into our tent we got the chance to talk about what just happened and I just say to Sam, what do you think that was about? And Sam just goes, listen, Doug, I know those girls tried to drug us, but I don't think they were bad people. They felt like victims to me. They felt like bait. That was the first time I thought about that, and it made the whole situation so much scarier. I hadn't looked past the idea that they were just hippie druggies trying to share their addiction. Thinking about it deeper was terrifying, because if they were bait, that means that there was somebody else orchestrating that. And their intention was to sedate us, or at least compromise us in the middle of nowhere. I don't think I came to that realization because I, I was fighting off all those drugs in my system. So all of my mental fortitude was going to trying to sober up and just trying to not be a liability. But Sam had been completely sober this whole time, mulling over every possible intention or outcome. And I just asked him, what do we do if we see them again? And he just says, I doubt we're going to see them again. There's no way they could have kept up with us. But if we see any more trail angels, be ready to run because we don't know who's with them. We're both exhausted from today's events, so we both dozed off quite quickly, and I fell into a tremendously deep sleep, because clearly my brain cells needed a rest. But at right about 4 a.m., Sam shakes me awake, and I wake up to him kneeling over me with his finger over his lips, signaling for me to be quiet. And once he could tell that I was coherent enough to understand his orders, he took the same finger that he was covering his mouth and pressed it to his ear to signal for me to start listening. I don't hear anything at first, then I catch it, I hear what he's hearing. And it sounded like a faint laughter followed by leaves rustling and just a light chatter getting closer to our tent. And me and Sam are just- They found y'all. Sitting there trying to make out what that could possibly be. Then we just hear an outburst of a laugh followed by an incoherent rebuttal. And we both recognized the tone of it. Once it got close enough, it was clearly cheery gossip. It was girls talking and laughing. There is no way that they could have found us. It was pitch black in those woods, and there was no way they were close enough to see where we got off trail. At 4 a.m., these girls were walking around all night trying to find these dudes. Part of me thought we were hearing things, but the chatter got louder and louder until they must have been only 20 feet away, and it sounded like they were just circling our campsite. We slowly 
and carefully unzip our tent so we could peek out to see as they're passing in front of us. But it was pitch black and we couldn't see a thing. We weren't going to get out and confront them because like I said, these girls might be bait. So me and Sam are just sitting there in this tent as quiet as possible, listening to these two girls circle our campsite, just chatting and laughing like they're in a high school lunchroom for almost a half hour. We just felt like it wouldn't be smart to get out and confront them. And we were right, because as the minutes passed, it sounded like more and more people entered their conversation. And eventually the conversations weren't coming from one source. It accumulated to the point where it sounded like there was conversations happening all the way around us. And it was so bizarre because it sounded like they were all having such a good time. And I couldn't even make out one male voice. It was like there was a hundred trail angels surrounding our tent. But when we would peek out to try to see them, it was too dark. We couldn't even see one figure. It was like they were right outside of our line of sight. And this chatter just went on for hours and hours. But as soon as the sun started showing up and rising, it was almost like this big gathering was slowly disbanding until it was completely quiet by dawn. So we finally stick our heads out of the tent when we could finally see deep into the forest. We looked in every direction and there was nobody around. And we both hop out of the tent looking around the area for signs of people, like litter or boot prints or any signals that would signify that there were people here. But there was absolutely nothing. I honestly would have thought that whatever they slipped me finally kicked in if Sam wasn't there. Because I would have thought I was hallucinating if he wasn't there to verify it too. That's how bizarre that experience was. And I could see how paranoid Sam is at this point, so I took the lead packing up camp. And I could tell that up until this point, he had felt a little bit alone in the situation. Because they turned me into a liability yesterday. And I wanted to make sure that he knew that I was back to 100%. And we were in this together. He was not alone anymore. I just say, do you remember how hard we trained for this? Do you remember how many miles we ran? This is the reason we did that. There's no way that these girls could keep up with us. We are treating this like an ultra marathon right now. Bro, I promise I'm fine. We need to focus on one foot after the other today. And I could see it in his face that he needed that. And this man gives me a light smirk and replies, who's going to carry the boats? It was the perfect answer because we were going to have to find the David Goggins inside of us. And it was the exact attitude change we needed because up until this point, it almost felt like we were being hunted, but now it felt like a challenge. And in our heads, there was no way they could keep up. So we hiked back to the trail and once we hit flat ground, we start loosening up a little bit. We basically chugged another instant coffee and we got to running. We just kept a steady pace for almost three hours. And our plan was to finish this stretch that ended on a peak. This stretch ends at a higher elevation, so we're going to be able to see our surroundings from a higher vantage point. We were done approaching this like fleeing victims, and we chose to start approaching it tactically. So we just kept jogging and jogging and jogging until we finally hit that peak. We felt accomplished once we got up there because we knew in our hearts that they could not keep up that pace. And we stayed at that peak for about five minutes just looking back towards the trail where we came from. We could see miles in the distance, but there was only a few areas of the trail that didn't have a canopy over it. So we just wanted to wait and see if there was anybody walking through those gaps in the canopy before we decided to make our next move. And then we saw them. We saw two white dots just way off in the distance, just slowly chugging away at a steady pace. And we could just tell that it was them, but they were miles behind us. And it felt like we were winning for a second until the rest of them entered that gap in the trail. It was a horde of white dots. It must have been 30 plus people just steadily marching in rows of two or three. And I just say to Sam, bro, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Crazy. And Sam replies, all I see is a group of people that can't keep up. And I needed to hear that because seeing that many people all in on this was terrifying. And all we could do was fight that victim mindset. And we decided, since we know they're still so far behind us, we might as well just rest right here. And we decide to just put our feet up for about 30 minutes so we could see where they are before we start running again. So that's exactly what we did. We scarfed down a couple power bars each, we chugged a good amount of electrolytes, popped another instant coffee, and we took a Navy SEAL nap with our feet up against one of the trees. And once it felt like the food settled and the second dose of caffeine kicked in, we both hopped up and checked where they were, and the horde still must have been about three miles behind us. And they still had this steep climb ahead of them. So we started to stretch out for another two minutes before we gave each other the nod of agreement that it was time to go. And we both just turned around to start running again. But we quickly realized that we spent the entire time looking behind us and we hadn't looked down the trail since we'd gotten here. After about five strides of just looking down at my feet, Sam slapped my chest telling me to stop. And I looked up down the trail and just about 10 feet ahead of us, there's two new girls in all white with a man standing in between them. 
and they're just staring at us like they were waiting for us to notice them. How did we not notice that they were there? Were they there this whole time while we were napping? This is where the fight or flight starts kicking in because we had that whole horde closing in behind us. And now we have the first man that we've seen and he's looking at us like he's the authority here. And these girls in front of us are just as loopy as the trail angels behind us. But he looks stern, focused, and sober. But he's also in that same white gown. And I whisper to Sam right away, they cannot stop us run right through him and we give each other the nod of agreement both fully prepared to run straight through this guy's chest and fight him off if we need to but at i think he might be the ringleader as we're about to take off he speaks up in a really calm gentle voice he just says gentlemen i could tell you're in a hurry but hear me out this took us off guard and i was a little bit curious to hear what he had to say but i wasn't about to give him more than one minute to explain himself and we give him a little nod to continue talking and he goes you two are as impressive as my girls told me you were. My girls are very fond of you, and they asked me to extend to you an invitation. You men clearly came out here to get a taste of freedom. How would you like to be truly free? How would you like to join the free? What is this weirdo talking about? Who is this guy? And how did the girls miles behind us report back to him so he knew how to cut us off here? And Sam just blurts out, bro, who are you? And he replies, as calmly as ever, it's not about who I am. It's about what I can offer you. And I cut him off by saying, the only thing you've been doing is stalking us. And he just laughs through my accusation. And this man replied, how can I stalk somebody who's in my home? When you entered these mountains, you became my guest. And we've treated you with nothing but kindness. And Sam rebuttals, your girls try to drug us. And again, he calmly justifies it by saying, there are no drugs here. There is only medicine and our medicine removes the veil. It allows you to see the beauty of our home and the possibility to be free. This man has cult leader written all over him. And before we get to rebuttal, he continues, we need men like you. My girls will be here any minute. If you join us, I can promise you a high ranking and as many wives as you see fit. Me and Sam have heard enough and everything that he just said confirms that we need to get out of there. And I just blurt out, nah, we're good. And we run right past him, ready to fight him off if we need to. But he just stood there and let us run right by him. But as we passed him, he said, you'll find that being our guests is much more pleasant than being our trespassers. And I knew we made the right decision right there because jumping from promises of freedom and the pick of a litter to mild threats is a clear sign of his bad intentions. We keep up a steady jog until they're completely out of sight. But this is the first time that I get the sense that I might not be able to keep up this pace. I was so prepared physically, but my feet were giving up on me. I could literally feel the blisters popping on my heels and around my big toes, but it just didn't feel safe to stop running. And I could tell Sam was dealing with something similar, but I think it was more of his knees because he was letting out grunts as we were jogging downhill. I even saw him slightly buckle a few times. But if he wasn't stopping, I wasn't stopping. And we keep up that pace until we get to another peak. And we both just naturally stop because that last ascension took a toll on. We desperately needed a break. And this time we scanned the whole area before relaxing to make sure that nobody could sneak up on us. And it was almost completely dark at this point. And we had spent nearly the entire day in a light jog going up and down hills. When I tell you my body has never been this fatigued before in my life, I mean everything hurt. I felt like I lost 10 pounds of water weight. I felt like my body was immediately absorbing the power bars the second I swallowed them. And I felt like my muscles couldn't soak up the electrolytes fast enough. And my calves and quads started spasming and cramping. But my adrenaline was still through the roof because I knew there was a horde of people marching in our general direction. And I knew they had bad intentions. And we just sat in silence for a couple minutes with our heads on our forearms sitting on the ground. Neither of us looked up, but we just started talking. And Sam just goes, we need to keep moving. Doesn't seem like they stop. How do they keep catching up to us? I'm as confused as he is, and I just say, maybe it's that stuff they're taking. It seems like they don't sleep, so they don't care how far ahead we get, because they know that we need to rest. And Sam asked me, how do you think they found our campsite last night? Unless they had somebody tailing us the entire time, there's no way they could have known where we left off the trail. How could they be so far behind us and then just casually walk up directly to our campsite in the middle of the night? They're or they could be so connected to the woods that the woods is telling them where you guys are. Or animals in the woods. They might be super connected to the, to the animals of the woods. The squirrels, the birds. 
clearly drugged out. It doesn't make any sense. This makes me so much more paranoid just sitting here because they must have somebody nearby just tailing us. So I just start scanning the woods around us for any sign of movement. But I'm so tired that even looking around is too much for my neck and I need to just put my head back into my lap. But right as I do, I swear I hear a faint little whisper coming from right inside the tree line. So I start looking around again and I just hear a light rustling of leaves. Like something is inching towards us, but I can't track down where it's coming from. And I'm waiting for one of these guys to appear out of nowhere and I just find myself back on my feet ready to fight when I hear another faint whisper but this time I can make out what it said it was a light help me and it was coming from directly behind me we both swing around to the source of the sound and we see somebody army crawling on their belly and elbows out of the tree line and they have their face face down into the dirt just dragging themselves onto the trail we immediately back up and get ready to start running but again the person just says please help me we don't don't immediately approach them because at this point we don't trust anything in these woods so we just watch this woman drag herself into the middle of the trail and slowly make her way to her feet and i'm just staring at this woman covered in mud from head to toe whispering quiet pleas for help but we don't run right away because she's not wearing white like everybody else and well shit that should give you a sign that she's not a part of their little in crowd she might be a victim like the little boy in the beginning who got snatched up and taken away she looked so scared. She didn't look loopy and euphoric like the other women. She honestly looked like she needed help. We look at each other and we make the choice to give her a chance. But we're still on high alert when we're approaching her. So we walk up to her and we hand her a bottle of water, but we keep it an arm's length away. And we... Did y'all hand her that other water? Just watch this woman sip the water. And by the way she's doing it, I could tell that she's not faking it. These sips of water were saving her life, and she was barely hanging on before this. Mm. So we just let her finish the bottle slowly until she's ready to explain herself. I'm glad they stopped to help this woman. We didn't want to pressure her to talk, but time was of the essence. Because we knew that these people were steadily closing the gap. And we needed to know what this woman's story was so we could make an educated decision. So Sam just really delicately asks her, Can you please tell us what happened to you? We do not have much time. She takes a deep breath and looks up at us with tears in her eyes and says, they aren't who they say they are. Please don't trust them. And we know right away that she's talking about the same people that have been harassing us. She must have seen the fear on our faces and recognized that it was the same fear that she was feeling. And I follow up by asking, who are they? Because if she knows that they aren't who they say they are, she must know who they really are. And we could tell that she's holding back tears as she's trying her best to fill us in on everything that she knows. And she goes on to tell us that they had drugged her and her boyfriend and she woke up in their camp. She said that they forced multiple women onto her boyfriend and they kept forcing her to drink some type of sedative and they just gave her to one of their men. They just kept telling her that she was going to be a great mother and mothering the free people was the greatest gift that she'll ever receive. She said that they had kept her there for weeks and she had fought back for the first few days. But she realized that if she act welcoming, they wouldn't force more sedation onto her. She said that when they finally gave her a break from the drugs and she was able to talk with them a little bit, she explained to them that she was barren. She thought that this was gonna end the continuous assaults, but they actually just got venomously angry and tried to kill her. See, this is what makes this man such a good storyteller too, is the little, the little things that he can add to a story that make it seem that much more believable is like you know he said when she started acting as if you know she was accepting what was happening she realized that they were sedate her less stuff like that stuff like that makes for a good story <laughs> or it, it just you know makes the story that much better she said that she barely got away, but once she was in the woods, it didn't seem like they tried to follow her. But she doesn't even know how long she's been lost for. She thinks it's been a week, but she can't be sure. And right when she finishes her sentence, her facial expression changes dramatically. She's looking at me like she's terrified, and I'm trying to understand what I did to scare her. And then I realize she's not looking at me. She's looking right over my left shoulder, directly behind me. And she just lifts her right hand, quivering and pointing, not able to say anything. And I already knew what I was going to turn around to. I know that I'm going to see those white gowns, so I just instinctively drop to the floor. Because as I'm turning around, I just instinctively grab the largest rock in arm's length. This rock was like the size of a baseball, but it was shaped more like a diamond. But when I turn around, I don't see anything, and I'm just scanning for movement. Then Sam just whispers, eyes. And right as he says it, 
I see what he's talking about. There's a set of bright amber eyes slowly walking towards us, but it's too dark to see the figure attached to it. And Sam just whispers, wait till he's close enough. And Sam's just standing there in a clear tactical stance. I can see that he has his hunting knife and his flashlight tucked near his belly with his knees slightly bent, ready to fight. And as we're standing there waiting for him to make his move, this man just starts talking in the same eerily calm voice. He just says, before I didn't want you to leave, but now I cannot let you leave. He's just slowly plodding towards us, inching closer, but not close enough to where we could see him. And we just stayed silent and let him keep talking, keep getting closer to us. And he just says, this woman wasn't meant to be free. She is attached to a life of concrete and rules. She has no place here with our people. This guy is just peddling weird lies and me and Sam are not buying into it whatsoever. We're just locked in, ready to make our move. And he seems so confident in the way that he's approaching us. And he's just yapping his bizarre philosophies. And part of me feels like he's being very foolish because he has no idea the levels of violence that me and Sam are ready to commit to protect this woman, let alone ourselves. I'm just waiting for Sam's signal. And while this man is mid-sentence, we see his faint outline. And Sam knows he's close enough, so he just firmly says, now. At the same time, he clicks his flashlight on and illuminates the entire figure for me. And the light clearly irritates his weird amber eyes, and he squints and leans a little bit back. When I tell you I did not hesitate for a split second, I took a baseball skip and I fired that rock as hard as I could. I threw it at this man while he was slightly blinded in mid-sentence, and the second it left my hand, I knew it got him. I couldn't believe how hard it hit this man in the forehead. I was almost half expecting him to catch it or reveal some type of secret vampire speed or something, but he was just a man, and I drilled that man in the forehead with a rock, and his head snapped back, and he fell right to his butt with a satisfying thud and grunt. We don't even consider waiting or checking him, because I'm sure his girls will find him and tend to him anyway. So we just grab this girl and take off running into the woods. We felt like we had a better chance heading straight off trail towards a road than staying on trail to wait until we got to a rest stop. We wanted to get out of these woods as fast as possible without running into them again. The poor girl that we found was so weak and slow at this point. So we were basically just carrying her the entire way and the woods are so much more physically demanding than the trail itself, especially after almost two full days of running. We were on our last legs, but we knew that we had just started violence with these people. At least they were pretending to be kind and nice to us, but we just broke the seal to violent behavior. I blasted that guy, and there's no way that they're going to take that lightly. We just do our absolute best to not stop in the pitch black, which felt like an absolute eternity. And honestly, there was no way to tell if we were staying in a straight line either. We just kept moving, that's all we could do. And we get to this one spot that had a steep downhill, to the point where you almost have to slide down it to keep going. So I went first, then I turn around to help the other two slide down so they don't roll an ankle, or land too hard at the bottom. And when I turn around, I realize that I'm in somebody's backyard. There was no fence or gate, but there was a couple children's toys and a makeshift playset. So I look to the left and I see a screen door that has a little back porch connected to a tiny house. So we circle around to the front and there's a tiny dirt road and they just have a worn down car. And I look down this dirt road and I could faintly see another house in the distance because they had a little lantern illuminating in front of their house. I was so confused for a second because we were just in the middle of the woods, but I remember an old YouTube video that I saw about places like this. We were in a holler. People live here. These are Appalachian natives that live in these little hollers and deep in the Appalachian woods. Most people think of these kinds of people as scary hillbillies. But the video that I saw on YouTube showed the reality of these hollers. They tend to be very kind, intelligent people, and their communities are very tight-knit, and all of them take care of each other. They usually just don't like the government intruding in their lives whatsoever. And I can't blame them, I feel the same way. I quickly brief Sam on what this is, and I try to explain to him that these are probably nice people and we should ask them to help. I start walking straight up to the front door, and Sam grabs my arm and says, Are you trying to get shot? It's the middle of the night. We need to call out to them and give them their space. And I immediately realize how correct he is. Even though I'm confident that they're most likely good people, they probably aren't used to strangers knocking on their door in the middle of the night. So Sam calls out, but not too loud because we're still concerned about the other people following us, but loud enough to wake somebody up in this house for sure. He does it about three times until we hear movement inside of the house. The window next to the door slides open and we see a barrel of a shotgun slip out and point right towards us. We immediately put our hands up and start explaining ourselves further. Sam just says as calmly as he can, We are very sorry to wake you. We were hiking the trail and we got lost. We found her lost in very bad shape and we need help. 
Sam immediately tosses his hunting knife to the right to try to show this guy that we were willing to relinquish all weapons to, to prove that we weren't a threat. Internally, I was wondering why he didn't mention the people that were following us. But Sam doesn't do anything without thinking it through completely. He must have had a good reason to withhold that information, so I took that as a cue to withhold that information as well. And finally, the person behind the shotgun speaks up. He just says, Y'all are lucky I didn't find you creeping up on my porch looking in my windows. He says, I promise y'all I'm not scared to introduce you to my friend Jesus. And then he started laughing and popped open his front door. He was exactly what you would expect him to look like. The man's appearance was genuinely terrifying. He's a deep woods country man with crazy eyes and scary teeth with a big scar on his face that looks like he got it from a heavy machinery accident. But even though he has a rough exterior, he has a genuinely cheery voice. And he just says, y'all ain't the first city folk to come knock on my door looking for help. And I try to build some type of rapport with this guy. So I just jokingly ask, city folk, what gave us away? And he looks at me with his crazy eyes for a second. And for a second, I thought I offended him. Then he replied, son, you don't look like you could change a tire before laughing in my face. And this was crazy because I had felt the grungiest I have ever felt in my entire life after these past few days. And he's telling me to my face that I look soft as baby shit. Mm -hmm. To be fair, compared to him, he was right. This was the first time I felt a little bit relieved. This man was friendly, he had firearms, a vehicle, a shelter, and he knew the woods well. And he became very inviting once he got a good look at us. He looked at you like he could see through you, almost as if what we were saying didn't really matter to him. But the look in your eyes is what he was really looking for. And once he saw what he needed to see, he fully accepted that we were there just needing help. And I could tell he didn't think we were even remotely a threat to him. He invited us in right away and he really simply said, there's some water and leftovers in the fridge and there's some blankets in the basket in the corner. I'll drive y'all to town in the morning. Then he just went right into his bedroom and seemed to go back to sleep. I couldn't believe how welcoming he was and how comfortable he was to just let us sleep in his home unattended. I guess it helped that he had a shotgun and we didn't, but I guess that's just how people in this area operate. They're just people of their word and they'll simply help if you need them. And the leftovers in his fridge weren't bad either. It was clearly some type of wild game steak and some simple potatoes. You would think that scarfing down somebody's leftovers in an Appalachian holler would be similar to a fear factor challenge, but this was simple, clean, and fresh. Or me and Sam had been running for two days straight and this girl had been lost in the woods for a week and anything would have tasted good. But after we finished eating, we just sat there in silence. We all wanted to talk about what happened, but it just didn't feel right making noise in this man's house or risking him overhearing us. We all just wanted to get in that car and drive to civilization where the people in white couldn't reach us. The morning could not come soon enough. I really quietly get up to gather some blankets for us when I see some movement in the corner of my eye coming from one of the windows. But when I look, there's nothing there. But I just continue doing what I'm doing until the door to the man's bedroom comes swinging open and he just speed walks to the front window. And he's just mumbling to himself something about his porch and something about leaving him alone, but I can't really make it out. And he just slides open his window the same way he did for us and puts the barrel of his shotgun out pointing at somebody. And he finally barks I told you I'm not interested. He's talking to this person like he knows them, so I'm a little bit confused. But the confusion goes away the second I hear the voice on the other end of that door. It's the man in white that I beamed with that rock. But still, his voice is extremely calm. He just says, you have a couple of hours in there with you. We would like to have them back, please. And the man looks at us with a horrified look on his face and starts barking at us. Y'all didn't tell me you were one of them. And the girl starts pleading to him immediately, asking him to not let them in. And me and Sam try to butt in that we don't want anything to do with these people. They've been chasing us. And he basically just yells shut up at all of us and takes a big deep breath before saying, there's nothing I could do to help y'all. They've already claimed you. I'm so sorry. And at that same moment, he lifts his shotgun and starts pointing at us while he starts saying something to himself. If you hear something, no, you didn't. If you see something, no, you didn't. And at the same time, he reaches one hand back to open his front door to reveal who's on the other side of it. I don't know what I was expecting because I knew I heard the man in white's voice, but I almost didn't believe it because of how hard I hit him with that rock. But there he was, standing in this doorway, looking as calm as ever, glaring at us with those weird amber eyes. But this time, I could see the gash I made on his forehead wide open and swollen. But it wasn't bleeding. It had some type of substance in it that looked like Vaseline. And he had no blood on his face either. It was wiped clean. 
but his gown was covered in blood. The front was almost entirely red, so I know I got him good. But his demeanor was no different than before, polite and cold, even after what I did to him. The girl was screaming and pleading, to the point where I saw the man in white get visibly annoyed, as if he found her annoying and was shaking off a headache. This man literally rolled his eyes and said, are you finished? And he did it in a sarcastic tone that did not match the tension in the room. Nobody knew what to say, so he just further explained his stance. He said, Miss, I don't even know why you're crying. We didn't even bother looking for you when you ran off. You have no use to us. Feel free to never come back here. It felt like I was listening to a popular kid tell off a nerd that they're irrelevant. He kidnapped this girl and is acting like her presence is an inconvenience. And she screams back at him, pouring with emotion. And she goes, you were going to kill me. And this guy just scoffs at her. He literally scoffs like she was being ridiculous. And he replied, We were only going to do that because I couldn't bear the thought of you spoiling the air of our beautiful home with your awful attitude. Me and Sam look at each other so confused because this guy's acting like he didn't kidnap this girl, steal her partner, and have her repeatedly assaulted for weeks. He was literally patronizing her while we're in the middle of a random man's house in the deep woods after they tracked us and attempted to drug us. Not to mention it's 4 a.m. and he just pulled up to this house and he has the owner of the house holding us at gunpoint. This man was acting sassy and sarcastic even after I almost took his head off with a rock and for some reason it made him so much more threatening because he was completely out of touch with reality. We were clearly nothing but an assignment to him, and he had no empathy for what he was doing or how cruel and sadistic this whole situation was. For him to keep this odd demeanor while throwing odd, petty comments at this clearly traumatized woman added layers of psychotic behavior to this man's aura, and I didn't even know that that was possible. This man genuinely did not care, and he didn't care that this woman escaped either, and he reaffirmed that with his following sentence. He said, these two boys will be coming with me, but this woman is useless and a terror to be around. You may do whatever you like with her. He was implying to the man in the holler that he could have her or he could let her leave. It seemed like he didn't care about the consequences of her leaving and reporting what happened to authorities. He had an essence about him that he felt untouchable. And this woman is stunned with what he's saying, so she couldn't even form a reply because she just realized that she was gonna be able to go home and she didn't wanna stir the pot even further. And the man in white just said, girls, can you please escort these two boys back to camp? And me and Sam have no choice but to let these girls come in and tie our hands together and escort us out of this house because this guy's still holding us at gunpoint. They finish tying the knots on our hands and they just gently guide us out of the front door. And I'm shocked at what I see. The entire horde of people had caught up to us and they were fully surrounding the house. It had to be over 50 women completely circled around us, and all of them had that weird, happy, euphoric look on their face. And the man in white just continues his orders once we get outside. And he says, girls, these boys have had a long day. Can you carry them back to camp so they can rest? This made no sense because there was no way these girls were gonna be capable of carrying us back to camp. But then four girls come walking over with what seems like two makeshift stretchers. They were two long logs with cloth connecting and these girls just really politely ask us to lay down on the cloth and we had bro what's what the what man nah there's something about these people they're not normal humans they got something else going on with them because how the heck they be catching up to folks no matter what time in the middle of the night they gonna catch up to you and now these girls are supposed to carry you back to camp how many days away is that? How many miles? What? I'm confused. This is crazy. All right. 16 over here. 21 over here.
No choice but to lay down. Then they strapped us in so we couldn't move, and then they just blindfolded us really gently. And I'm just laying there on this weird stretcher as I hear multiple women walk to both sides of this stretch and they just lift me off the ground. I could tell that they just lifted me off the ground at first and then more maneuvered under it and put the logs on their shoulders because I could feel that that lifted me even higher. And then they just began to walk steadily with me. I couldn't tell in what direction, but they seemed to be handling my weight just fine because all of the voices around me seemed as cheery as ever. And we're just going steady for about five minutes and then I hear the man's voice directly to my left. It was as if he was just walking right next to where I was being carried and he was just talking to me out loud. And he started off by encouraging me to get some rest on the journey back. He said, because we had earned it and that we're gonna need to recover as much as we can before some ceremony. Then he spends the next 20 minutes basically preaching the philosophies of his people. It was so odd. It was like he was doing a sales pitch, just feeding me this weird cult-like rant. And he was painting this picture of a euphoric heaven-like community and how that we should feel blessed that we were chosen. He spends some time explaining their rules and their lifestyle and how amazing it was to be a man in their society. He was so out of touch and he had no idea how he was coming off. He was painting this picture that sounded so amazing on the surface, but had undertones of intense misogyny, drug abuse, and extreme ice-cold violence. And mind you, I'm strapped to a makeshift stretcher as he's telling me all of these things. And he's doing it super casually as if this is a regular Saturday afternoon for him. I think that was the scariest part about him, how casually he was acting in a situation that he created, a situation that was so bizarre and intrusive. And he finally shut up and stopped his cultish rant and I just found myself laying on this stretcher. I'm just blindfolded trying to tone out these drugged out girls gossip. They carried us for hours and I actually eventually dozed off for a bit, even though I was being forcefully kidnapped. I had been running for two days and the light rocking of being carried mixed with the comfort of laying on this cloth felt like a five-star hotel. But I didn't just doze off, I was out like a light. And this had to have been the deepest sleep of my life because by the time I woke up, I felt so rested. It was like the first time you sleep in after finals week and you have the luxury to not set an alarm. You just sleep until your body's ready to wake up. And when I woke up, I was initially very confused because I was no longer on the stretcher anymore and I didn't have a blindfold on and my hands weren't tied. I was on some type of cot with a pillow and a blanket. And when I sat up, I saw that Sam was already awake, peeking out of the front of the tent. And the first thing that came to my head to say was, where are we? And Sam looked back at me slightly surprised to see me awake, but he didn't seem super on edge. I could tell that he had slept too, but he was already actively game planning and stalking out our surroundings. And he just replied, dude, you gotta see this. So I crawl over to peek out the front of this tent and it's so bright outside. So it must have been at least noon the next day. I was expecting to be at some type of prison camp in the middle of the deep woods, but that's not what this was like at all. This place was beautiful and lively, filled with women and children and even the elderly, but they were all wearing those same white gowns. They looked so happy and content doing what seemed to be daily chores. This was a bustling and flourishing community in the middle of a national park. We were in a beautiful clearing, surrounded by luscious greenery, beautiful mountaintops. The only way I could explain it is an Amish lifestyle mixed with a Native American lifestyle, sprinkled with a little bit of heaven. Every sprinkled with a little bit of heaven. Yo, this, this, this story is so crazy. How would they not know going into the mountains or going into the national park that this is a thing where there's people that live out there there's these indigenous feral people that live out there in the freaking woods everybody should be aware of that before going to these woods i think about this place just seems so lovely there weren't any major structures or vehicles or machinery or even any major tools in sight there were a couple of dainty carriages and horses but the only structures around resembled what you would imagine a Native American teepee looked like. I had so many questions and I knew in my heart that I should still be scared, but something about not being tied up anymore and left to sleep on a nice cot, accompanied by what I was looking at and my surroundings, honestly made me relax a little bit. I didn't feel like I was in immediate danger. And I just look at Sam and I say, should we go say hello to somebody? And Sam looks back at me, still with a little bit of concern in his eyes. And I could tell he's battling a similar sense of relief. He just replies, 
I don't see why not. So we just crawl out of this tent trying to make eye contact with somebody. We're just trying to strike up any type of conversation or dialogue with anybody. But none of the adults seemed to acknowledge us initially. But two young children ran over to us and handed us a couple of flowers that they picked. And they just say, we're so happy you're here and run away laughing. And then finally a woman acknowledges us and she walks over to us and she has a little bit of that euphoric, drugged out look. And she says, Charles asked me to send you to him when you wake up. Please follow me. And she turns and walks into the direction of the biggest TP in the area. And as we're walking over there, I'm just looking around, soaking in this incredible community. I can't believe how efficiently this community is operating and how well and put together everybody looks here. But my thoughts get cut off as we arrive at the tent and she just escorts us in. And a little bit of my dread starts seeping back in because the man in white, who apparently is named Charles, is sitting in the tent waiting for us. And me and Sam are just standing there awkwardly. We don't give him any greeting or any form of acknowledgement. We're just staring at this dude. And he just stands up and walks right in front of us. And he calmly says, like he always does, just super calmly, gentlemen, I hope you had a good night's sleep. And I'm looking over his shoulders a little bit and I see that there's two other men sitting inside this TP with him, but they didn't stand up and acknowledge us. And Charles didn't seem to like that and he encourages those men to stand up and introduce them to us. And the two men begrudgingly stand up and walk over to us. The first one just shakes my hand regular and moves on to Sam. But the second one shakes my hand and when I make eye contact with him, he's staring holes through and he has the most bizarre look on his face. Either this guy has zero social IQ and has no idea how off-putting his facial expression is, or this guy has seen a ghost and because he, he has genuine shock on his face. But then Charles starts talking again, and I could tell it's going to be another one of his monologues, but I just let him go on and on. Because as much information as he's willing to give us, we're all ears because it could potentially be useful. And he goes on to explain to us that this community has over 300 people, and apparently they've been out here since the first settlers in America. He explains further that this is what America is supposed to be, and this was the dream that our ancestors had when they immigrated. He says that they are the only free people left. He says that our ancestors immigrated here to get Get away from overreaching government. And over the course of the last hundred years, the government that we tried to escape has slowly wrangled all of the descendants of the revolutionaries. And then he starts explaining how the freedom that we experience is nothing but an illusion. Being packed into dense cities, paying overbearing taxes, and being forced to work for small amounts of money that you immediately need to pour back in the system to simply survive. And then he starts trying to butter us up, starting to compliment us about how we're real men and that we deserve better. We don't deserve to be working class slaves to the ultra wealthy elite. He said we deserve to be leaders in communities like this instead of being forced to vote for puppet that only have the intent to line their own pockets and to pass laws that just keep the rich rich and the slaves slaves. And the entire time he's talking, I feel the other guy just staring daggers through me. But I try to avoid eye contact with, but it eventually became too much, so I take a second look at his face. And I realize that he's the only person that I've seen that doesn't have those amber eyes. He has regular blue eyes like me. And I initially think he must have just joined them recently, or maybe he was brought here like I was brought here. But he How is it that everybody have amber eyes? They must be doing something to these people, man. Didn't seem to be uncomfortable here or around Charles. He seemed to be uncomfortable with me, but I couldn't tell why. Sam finally speaks up and asks Charles some follow-up questions. The main one being, if it's so beautiful here, why'd you force us to come? And I look back at Charles because that seems like a fair question. And I realized at that moment that I had never seen Charles smile before. He had been calm and polite in every interaction that I've had with, but this was the first time that I'd seen a smile on his face. And he went from being a little bit odd to terrifying. The amber eyes were one thing, but his teeth were like something I've never seen. Every single one of his teeth seemed to be carved down and shaved into a sharp point. It was almost like he had shark teeth. It wasn't vampire-like or supernatural, but he had clearly done this to himself intentionally. And it was especially intimidating when you take into account that I had hit this man in the face with a rock last night. And he's just standing there staring at us so calmly with a mouthful of daggers. And he goes on to explain that we were forced here for our own good and that he's offering us a better life free of stress and poverty with as many wives as we desire. Neither of us answer because we want him to just keep talking. That seemed like a half-assed explanation and he could sense that we were feeling that way. So I'm good on all that.
I'd rather go back to civilization. He kept talking. He takes a big sigh and then he says, listen, you two are here because we need you here. You see, the women outnumber the men here almost 20 to 1. Even though we do our best to spread our love and our seed, we're running into a problem of inbreeding and that would be very detrimental to our way of life. You see? How y'all want... Wait, I, I, I kind of get it. I was like, how they running into a problem with inbreeding when they got way more women than they do men? When you start with having more women than you do men, then more of the men are sleeping with all of the women. So you got, let's say it's five men and 15 women to start with. Those five men are sleeping with all 15 women. And then those women are having kids. And those men are also sleeping with the kids that are probably not their own. Crazy to think about, I know. And then, then the kids are sleeping with the, it's just a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> My God. Disgusting. With a community of this size that's fully self-reliant, our children need to come out healthy and strong. So you two have been brought here to spread your seed and father the next generation of free people. And then he ends it with a joking tone by saying, now that doesn't sound so bad, does it? As though we should be ecstatic about the idea of impregnating his entire population of women. Not only that, but... No, because those are going to be my kids. I don't want my kids in this mess. <laughs> and then on top of that, they trying to sell them on the idea that, here, you get to have all these women to be with. But you just got to come stay here, live here for the rest of your lives. No, that don't sound so good to me. That don't sound so good to me. I'd rather have my civilization and my lack of women because that's my life. It's every man's dream, right? And I'm looking at him so confused because he knows nothing about us. And he's saying this like this pitch is gonna work and we're just immediately gonna change our tune and be super excited that he kidnapped us and brought us here. Internally, I wanna start an argument with this guy, but Sam decides to take a different approach. He just says, Charles, I have a wife and children at home. I know that Sam's lying about this, but I just wanna see how Charles reacts. And Charles just smiles with his horrific smile. And then he says, and you may choose to go back to them once my next litter is conceived. I am mind blown at what this guy is telling us. He literally went to all of this effort to bring us here to impregnate all of these women, over 100 women. And then he's telling us we can just leave. Me and Sam are stunned by this offer. And honestly, we both don't have anything to say. So Charles just ends the conversation by saying, please, boys, go get some food and rest. All A hundred women? How, how many STDs is that? Of our people are gathering here tomorrow for your introduction to our people. I want you to consider the offer I gave you today and consider the great good that you would be doing for my people. Then the woman that brought us there escorts us out of the tent. And the last thing I see before I leave is that other dude in the tent just staring right through me still. It was so weird because after the woman escorted us out, she just went off and did her own thing. I'm sorry, I have to say this because it, it, it sounds as though this cult leader is making it seem as though he has this understanding of men. Like a man has no problem impregnating a woman and having his seed, his, his child out in the world as if it's not his own. Like he's emotionally uh, uh detached or detached of any responsibility to this child that's literally the case of me my father and my existence that that's literally the case there but it's not my story right it wouldn't be my story i wouldn't be able to do something like this because I'm, I'm i'll be too busy those are my kids and you want me to go back into my life and now i have hundreds of kids out here without their father no I know y'all got a whole community. Y'all can raise them how y'all want them to be, but I don't want that for my kids. That's crazy. Hell no. Me and Sam were just left to our own devices. So we just started wandering around this camp talk, and I just go ahead and open the conversation with, why do you think nobody's guarding us? Why are they just letting us walk around? And Sam just shrugs his shoulders and replies, we must be so far into the woods, they just don't even think it's possible for us to escape. That seems logical enough to me, so I just move on to my next question. Do you think he'll really just let us leave if we do this for him? And Sam just shakes his head and replies, I don't know, but doing that just doesn't sit right with me. No. It doesn't sit right with me creating all of these lives that are going to be stuck here in this bizarre cult their entire life. And that's exactly what I was thinking too. The idea of bringing dozens of children into that man's cult 
would haunt me for my entire life. Thanks. I don't know if I'd be able to live with myself if there was dozens of children of mine living under the rule of that man, just leaving them with a man with a mouth filled with shark teeth. Thanks. If they're willing... My, my, my kids will be like, Daddy, why'd you do this? I didn't ask for this. I never... I didn't want this. I don't want to be here. No. Because I used to say stuff like that, man. To do what they did to us for the last few days, imagine what they're capable of. No one deserves to be born into that. And clearly, everybody here that seems happy is loaded up with drugs to keep them compliant. And I just asked Sam, bro, do you have a game plan in mind? What are you thinking about this? And Sam just plainly goes, there's no way we're staying here to do all of them. But we might need to do a few to buy ourselves time to see how many men they have, learn their patterns, and then take them out. And there's no way they're gonna make us do more than two a day. And they clearly let us wander around freely. So we might have a shot at complying and gaining their trust. And then we can make our move once we have enough information without having to go through so many women. I can't believe the reality I'm being faced with, but he's making a point. Buying ourselves time might be our best option. And Charles even mentioned that the women outnumber the men almost 20 to one. So if we could figure out how to take out the men, we might be able to really end this thing. And we just just spent the rest of the day trying to take in as much information about these people's patterns and how they operate before we have that does make a lot of sense is to, to buy time so that you can see the pattern of these people so that you can take them out how they gonna take them out I don't know headed back to our tent as the sun was going down me and sam were just sitting there mulling over all the patterns that we noticed throughout the day and just pitching each other different game plans as we heard somebody approaching the tent so we both just sat there and acted natural waiting for the person to enter our tent i was expecting either charles or one of his girls but a man just barrels in with his hood on acting as if he was trying to not be seen he sat down in front of us really quickly and looked at me as he took off his hood and he's just staring at me white as a ghost and it's that same dude that wouldn't stop staring at me in charles tent with those same eyes and he just opens it and he just opens up the conversation by saying what are you planning to do i initially thought that he had overheard us and was interrogating us so i just didn't even reply and he follows up by saying you cannot be here tomorrow what is your plan and i don't know what else to do but play dumb so i just say bro what are you talking about and he just says you need to leave you do not belong here and he follows it up by saying, I would leave with you, but they took me while I was too young. And I don't know anything else but this. And I can't watch the same thing that happened to me happen to you. And Sam seemed to be a little bit convinced by this statement. So he says, we're going to go through with the ceremony to buy ourselves time. Because we don't even know where we are. But we don't plan on staying for as long as he expects us to. And this guy starts shaking his head as if what Sam said is not the right move. And he just says, no, no, no. If you stay for the ceremony, you will never leave. They're going to force you to drink what all of the others drink. And they're going to force you to drink it every day until you can barely move and barely take care of yourself. And they're going to use you as breeders until you're sterile or dead. I promise you, if you don't leave tonight, you will never leave. This man's eyes are filled with tears at this point, And now I'm the one staring at him. Until you're sterile or dead. Like, what do they mean by that? How is it that they're going to become sterile? Are they going to be busting that many lows that is going to make them sterile? Is that how it works? And I can't help but to feel like he looks familiar, but I just can't put a finger on it. And he's just looking at me through his tears. He's looking at me like he knows what I'm thinking. They prefer taking children so they don't have to deal with resistant grown men. They're going to use you as a tool against inbreeding. And then they're going to discard you so they have all of the women to themselves. And then he looks at us both very seriously and he says, You both have to leave right now. And at the same time, he hands over a small pouch that feels like grains or seeds. And he says, They're not guarding you because they know they can track you. You've noticed all of their eyes, haven't you? The ones with those eyes can see clearly in the dark. They've developed that trait over generations of intentional breeding. They see as clearly in the night as you can see in the day. So they can follow you all night when you need to rest. I promise you there's no outrunning them. But I promise if you listen to me and you do everything I say, you might be able to get to a road before they catch up. And he begins to explain to us that we need to go barefoot. And we need to be very intentional with where we are stepping. We need to walk over thick layers of leaves to avoid leaving tracks. And when you get to the trail, you need to walk a mile down to get closer to a main road. But before you turn off trail to go to that main road, you need to look to your left and make it seem like you chose to go left. You need to go to the edge of the tree line and step on sticks as if you walked through there. Then Bro, I love this. It said you got to walk through very dense, thick leaves so that it's harder for them to track your footsteps. You got to... Make it seem like you're going to go left when you're really going to go right. Ah, I like this.
and you need to pick up rocks and throw them into the trunks of the trees on that side only. Then you must turn around and gently exit the trail in the opposite direction. Bro, if this man has never escaped himself, how does he know this? How is he telling them this? This part don't make any sense. You're stuck there, but you can tell somebody how to escape with a mastermind plan? What? And when you go that direction, you must make sure you don't break any sticks or crush any plants. And once you're about five meters into the tree line, you need to start sprinkling that bird seed that I just gave you. And make sure you sprinkle it gently, otherwise they'll notice it. I'm initially very confused because it's almost like he's speaking in riddles. And I can't help myself but to ask why. And he looks at me a little annoyed because he wasn't done explaining. And then he keeps going and he says they know where you turn because the birds leave the area. You hit the trees on the opposite sides with the rocks so the birds leave that area. Then you sprinkle the bird seed in the direction that you actually go so the birds follow behind you. This will give you a big enough head start and you might actually get away. And any turns you decide to make, you need to repeat that process. If you break a stick while you're walking, you need to pick it up and throw it as far as you can. I promise you, they are master trackers. Even if you step on a fern or a flower, fix it or remove it and patch the dirt. I promise you, they see everything. And if you stop and rest, please do not start a fire. Do not make a shelter. They could spot any irregularities, even in the pitch black. If you need to rest, lay on the ground in between two logs and never stop more than two hours. They will catch up to you and you need to stay ahead. But listen very closely because this- That makes so much sense, never stop more than two hours. Cause it always felt like it was like two hours or so that they would end up catching up. Is the most important part. When you get to a road or into a community, do not ask for help. Just get yourself to public transportation and get yourselves home. I we already know what happens if they ask for help, they ask for help. And that help end up spilling the beans the most important part when you get to a road or into a community do not ask for help just get yourself to public transportation and get yourselves home i promise you the park rangers will not help you the police won't help the locals definitely won't help they will all tip them off the locals have an unspoken agreement with us if you hear something no you didn't and if you see something no you didn't because they know how cruel and persistent our leaders can be and sam just asks him why don't you come with us and help us escape and he just shakes his head and says i wouldn't have anything to go back to i only remember glimpses of my old life and then he lightly smiles and says i think i remember having a sister but i can't be sure and then he looks back at me and says it's time you need to go right now do you remember everything that i just told you and i look at sam because i'm hoping he retained the parts that i've forgotten already and we both just nod our heads yes the idea of going back to running from these people like we had been doing the past couple of days seemed like an exhausting and impossible task especially with no shoes but if bro he, th there should be a movie made about this man oh what he told us is remotely true it is now or never and honestly what was the worst that they could do just catch us again and then we're right back to where we're at currently and we get out of the tent and it's so bizarre because everybody is just asleep there were no guards and nobody noticed us leaving camp they were that confident that we couldn't escape that man with the regular eyes gave us a general direction to start walking to get back to the trail. So we just walked in that general direction for hours. And it took us all night to get back to the trail. And it was almost dawn by the time we arrived. And we just took a left and walked one mile, just like he said. And we did exactly what he told us to do with the sticks and the rocks and the bird seed. And we just continued to go off trail in the direction that we were hoping a road would. It became extremely tedious patching up the flowers that we stepped on and constantly throwing all the sticks that we broke. But he seemed adamant that it was the only way we would get out of here. So we just kept doing it. During that long trek, we had no idea if we were even going in the right direction or where a road would even pop up. And no road came the first day. And we rested in between logs, just like he told us to. And part of me felt like they were going to circle us at any second. And I felt like they were behind us the whole time but nobody ever showed up. We did the rock and the bird seed thing again when we decided we had enough rest. And we just kept going and going, throwing sticks and patching flowers and just walking as delicately as we possibly could. And then we finally saw it. We saw the road. It was just a narrow little highway with no cars driving on it. And that's where the nerves actually started really kicking in because we definitely looked dirty and like we needed help. But if anybody stopped and asked us if we needed help, we would have to convince them that we didn't. And that's where the real paranoia started kicking in because when a car would drive by and pull over and ask us if we needed a ride, we had to pretend that we didn't 
and we had to just keep walking. And obviously we didn't want to go back into the woods. And the idea of going back into the woods was more horrifying than the idea of having to fight off a local. The entire walk down that road, I just felt like the people in white were going to pop out of the tree line at any second, but they never did. And we eventually stumbled up to a town that ended up being called Lexington. And we're just walking around this town at like 6 a.m. just trying to read the signs. Just trying to find one that directs us to... I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust this town either. A local bus station. And I realized at that moment, I don't have any of my belongings. And I have no money to pay for this bus ticket. And of course, I mentioned it to Sam. And Sam just gives me a little smirk and takes off his hat. And he peels back the lining of the interior of his hat. And he pulls out a few 20s. And he just says, always keep your cash in a hidden stash. Thanks. And it was the most beautiful Thanks. sight that I've ever seen. Just five crisp $20 bills. The town's starting to come alive and we see people walking around and we just start beelining to this bus station. And as we get there, we see two buses in the lot. And we just go up to the teller and we just ask, where are those two buses going? And the teller says, the one on the right's going to Roanoke, but it's leaving in five minutes. And Sam just cuts her off and says, two tickets to Roanoke. And just hands her the 20s. Roanoke is where we started this trip. It's where our car was, and we lay down in the bus the entire ride so nobody would be able to spot us through the window. That man saved our lives by teaching us how to avoid their tracking methods. The Appalachian Trail is beautiful, but I promise you there's feral people inside those woods. Guys, I really appreciate- Man, it makes me never want to go to the Appalachian Trail. Look, that'd be crazy. That'd be crazy if some feral people out there in the Appalachian Mountains or the trails of the Appalachians. Y'all, it's time for y'all to leave y'all thoughts, comments, and opinions down below. And I'm going to catch y'all in the next one. See ya!